This week, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu failed to form a majority coalition in the Knesset by the extended deadline that had been given to him, and that forces the people of Israel back to the polls again in September the 17th of this year. So my subject is this, Israel must vote again, and the peace plan is in jeopardy. This is big news, folks. Now, we know that uh, Donald Trump has been a great friend of Israel since he's taken the White House, and he and Benjamin Netanyahu have had powerful chemistry between the two of them as far as working out a lot of these situations. Trump has sent his son-in-law, uh, Jared Kushner, and uh, Jason Greenblatt and David Friedman, the U.S. ambassador to Israel. These people have been working overtime for the last two years, working not only with Israel and with the Palestinians, but with all the players in that region to try to work out the best prospect for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, now, uh, with Benjamin Netanyahu having been voted in in the last election in April, and now he's failed to form a coalition that's put a real monkey wrench in this whole process, and nobody knows exactly how it's going to come up. And so we're going to talk about that tonight and look at it in terms of Bible prophecies. I'm going first to an article in the Jerusalem Post today, and the title of it is, The Party Leaders Take Their Gloves Off As a Repeat Race Begins. And the big issue in this, in this failure to create a government is a man named Avidor Lieberman. Now, Lieberman was formerly the Minister of Defense for Israel, and last year he quit his job over his protest at Netanyahu's handling of one of the conflicts with the uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip. But as it turns out, Lieberman has just become a real troublemaker in this entire scenario, and a lot of people are blaming Lieberman for having foiled uh, Netanyahu's attempt to create a right-wing coalition. This article says Netanyahu accused Lieberman of telling another party head that he would not join the government because if he did, Netanyahu will last another 10 years. Now, there's, there's some bad blood between Netanyahu and Lieberman that goes back many years, and uh, it's really got to a silly stage here with this guy, Lieberman. Last year, uh, I was in New York at the Jerusalem Post conference, and I heard uh, Avidor Lieberman speak to the uh, audience that day along with Ehud Olmart, who was one of the former prime ministers of Israel, uh, Naftali Bennett, who was the minister of education at that time, a lot of these high-level uh, Israeli politicians and government officials. And it just struck me at that time that Avidor Lieberman uh, seemed to be, in my opinion, a, a lightweight for the responsibility that seemed like he had with the government. And it wasn't long after that till he ended up quitting that position. And uh, I know my opinion is not worth a lot on these matters, but it just seemed like to me Lieberman does not really deserve all the attention he's getting because he doesn't have the abilities. He doesn't have the intellect and whatever uh, to guide Israel. And he wants, he wants to put Netanyahu out of business. And I guess he thinks he can run the government, but I don't believe there's hardly anybody in, the, in Israel that thinks he can really run the government. At any rate, he's turned out to be a horrible spoiler. In a statement to media in Jerusalem, Benjamin Netanyahu called Lieberman a serial toppler of right-wing governments. He displayed a chart of the party Israel Betanu's mandates in recent elections and said Lieberman used the conscription issue as a patent to save the party from falling below the threshold. And Netanyahu accused Lieberman of telling another party head that he would not join the government because if he did, Netanyahu would last another 10 years. He said the lesson is that the right cannot trust Lieberman, Netanyahu said. He acts drunk from power out of personal ambition against the good of the country. Of course, people in the Betanu party responded by accusing Netanyahu of lying because he's under pressure. But I've got another article here in just a moment. I'm going to share it with you from Carolyn Glick, where it looks like Carolyn's got the same opinion of, of uh, Lieberman as Netanyahu does, and basically the same opinion I have of this guy. But there's another article in today's news in the Jerusalem Post that says, according to a Jerusalem Post poll, the Likud, which is Netanyahu's party, and Yisrael Betanu, the party of Lieberman, both of these seem to be rising in the polls after this crisis. The poll found 
that two-thirds of Israelis are upset by the decision to disperse the Knesset only a month after it was sworn in to hold another election. The people of Israel blame both Prime Minister Netanyahu and Avidor Lieberman for this repeat election that's going to take place September the 17th. But the poll also says they will both reward their parties with more seats. A panel research poll taken on Thursday for the Jerusalem Post found. The poll found that two-thirds of Israelis are upset by the decision to disperse the Knesset just a month after it's sworn in. When asked who is to blame, 46% of them said Lieberman is to blame, 35% said Netanyahu, and other smaller percentages for other reasons. If the election was held now, the poll so says that uh, Lieberman's party would increase from its current five seats to nine, but also the Likud would gain two more seats, taking it 35 to 37. So it looks like we're headed for another really cliffhanger in this upcoming election, and it's still almost impossible to predict. In fact, I would say it is impossible to predict what the outcome of it is going to be. Among center-right voters, 57% said that Lieberman's behavior decreased their chances of voting for his party, and only 15% said it raised the chances. So we've got a real nasty situation going on in Israel right now, and the problem is that the fact that we don't have a government has thrown a real kink in the United States' efforts to bring about a peace plan this year. Now, Donald Trump's term is only for four years unless he's reelected in 2020. And that means we only got about a year and a half left of uh, Trump's prime time to bring about this peace plan if he doesn't get elected again. And I'm hopeful that he will get elected again. But nevertheless, after, uh, after Lieberman has thrown this kink, one of the reasons Netanyahu could not form the government is because Lieberman would not give the support of his small party, and that caused Netanyahu to come up just a few uh, a few seats short of the 61 majority that he needed to have a, a coalition government in the Knesset. Now, I'm going to go to this article by Carolyn Glick in Breitbart today, and the title of it is, Avidor Lieberman, Israel's One-Man Wrecking Ball. Now, here's there's an interesting thing, because in two weeks from now, I'm going to be going back to New York for the uh, Jerusalem Post Conference. And they, two of the keynote speakers for that is going to be Avidor Lieberman. So I'm going to be hearing Lieberman in about two weeks from now. Plus, Jason Greenblatt is going to be one of the key speakers of the Jerusalem Post Conference. And I'll be hearing Greenblatt, and, the, and they say that one of the principal uh, discussions of that entire conference this year is going to be Greenblatt's uh, deal of the century, Trump's deal of the century, the American peace plan for that era. Now, just this week, Greenblatt has been in the Middle East. He's been to Jordan, and he's been to Morocco talking with these uh, Muslim parties about uh, some of the details on this upcoming peace plan. And so they are going to proceed as best they can without a, an, basically without Netanyahu's uh, uh, certainty in the upcoming government. The Knesset has been dissolved, and so the government right now is pretty much in shambles. But nevertheless, the United States has a meeting scheduled in Bahrain coming up uh, in the month of June, and there's going to be a meeting of the Arab states with the United States Peace Party, and they're going to try to keep continue working on this project, try to make some progress. They've said that they can't actually uh, make too many comments about how it's going to work out politically, but they are going to try to work on the economic components of the Middle East Peace Plan. I don't want to get too much into this article by Carolyn Glick, but she says the man responsible for Israel's political chaos right now is former Defense Minister Avidor Lieberman. He is a native of Moldova. He leads the Israel Betanu Party, which he formed 20 years ago. His party won five seats in April in the, out of the 120-seat Knesset, which shows what a small minority party it is. Although it's a paltry faction, its size was sufficient to block Netanyahu's forming a government. Without Lieberman, Netanyahu only had a coalition of 60, which was one short of the simple majority that he needed. 
She said, this isn't Lieberman's first rodeo. Last November, Lieberman resigned his position in protest over Netanyahu's refusal to go to war with Hamas in Gaza after Hamas began pummeling Israel. He took his six-member faction with him, and that's what caused the last government to collapse is when the Tibetan new party pulled out. And that's why they had to go to the other polls in, in, in April. Now the same man, Lieberman, is forcing him to go to the polls again. He's a troublemaker. Carolyn Glick said, in other words, by the time the next elections are held in September, Lieberman's refusal to work with Netanyahu will have left Israel without a stable government for 10 months. Now think about this. Israel has got a, an unstable government for 10 months because of this man Lieberman. Now I'm really particularly interested in what's going to come of this conference uh, here in a couple of weeks. And I hope to be able to report to you some positive news about uh, how this deal of the century is actually going to begin to unfold. Now, at the core of Lieberman's protests against Netanyahu is Lieberman's position that Israel needs to be much, much tougher on Hamas down in the Gaza Strip. You know, if you follow the news here in the last 30 days, there have been many hundreds of missiles that have been fired out of the Gaza Strip into the southern Israel. In one week, over 700 missiles. And now we know that the biggest part of those missiles, if not the vast majority of them, are, are, are Iranian missiles. They've been fired off by Hamas and by the Islamic Jihad group. And uh, it's a nasty, nasty situation down there. It's, it's not the kind of a situation that any politician wants to have to deal with and not the least of that would be Benjamin Netanyahu. But there is a catch-22 to that Gaza Strip dilemma. The problem is, even though Israel could theoretically go down there and bomb the smithereens out of Gaza Strip, that would leave Gaza without a government, and that would leave Israel responsible for the rebuilding of Gaza, and that's a responsibility they don't want to have. That was given up by... Ariel Sharon, back in his day, before he died, he said it's time for Israel to take their hands off this thing and let these people do whatever it is they want to. That proved to be a very disastrous decision because now we've got Hamas in there and Iran has moved in there to support Hamas. And so basically, uh, the Gaza Strip has become a proxy for Iran. Now, we know that Iran's causing trouble all over that area. And you can't you can't go too far to blame Netanyahu for his handling of Gaza Strip because it's one of the biggest nightmares on earth. It's one of the most difficult situations any politician would ever have to deal with. And uh, so it's a very complicated situation. That's why the United States has played such a major role. But they're not the only players. You've got Israel and Palestine is just the core of this problem. The, the bigger picture is, and we've talked about this so many times on this program, and that is you've got all these other pr players that are prophesied in the Bible who are going to be getting involved in this Israeli conflict before Jesus comes. Now, we, we've got two major wars prophesied in the Bible. We've got the Sixth Trumpet War, which is the Four Horsemen War that is going to take place on the Euphrates River, probably up in Syria, eastern Syria. We've already pretty much identified the players. Those four horsemen are the white horse of Catholicism, the red horse of communism, the black horse of capitalism, and the green horse of Islam. And we know who they are. The white horse is the Pope. The red horse is Vladimir Putin. The green horse is people like uh, Recep Erdogan of Turkey and uh, Rouhani and uh, Ayatollah of Iran. And the black horse is Trump of capitalism, of, of the West. And I've, I've commented before, and I think it's worth saying again, a lot of people wonder uh, what Trump's role is in all this, especially, especially from a prophetic role. And I've tried to explain that uh, according to that four horsemen prophecy, there has to be a capitalist horse at the Euphrates River War. Now, if we had not voted in Donald Trump, 
we might not even have a black horse left in the world. If, if Hillary Clinton had been elected and if Barack Obama's, uh, all of his dirty deals had continued on as they were, then the United States at this very moment would probably be falling into hardcore socialism, which would quickly lead to communism. And there would be no black horse left on the earth. We know that Europe has already fallen, as it were, into socialism and Islam. The West is no longer a stronghold for capitalism. It's a stronghold for socialism and Islam. We've seen an article this very week that says uh, London is no longer English. It's become just about Muslim. We've got Muslims running many of the major cities in Britain today. We see Angela Merkel has become an effective uh, mullah, opening up the doors for all the Islamic terrorists to take over Germany. France is falling. They just voted Macron down and put another uh, president uh, is being elected in France. We got uh, the, the, the Muslims are effectively destroying France. And so if Donald Trump had not won the capitalist role as the president of the United States, we wouldn't have four horses to go to that prophecy uh, war in uh, Revelation chapter nine. And so for that reason, I tend to think that Donald Trump's probably going to be reelected because we've got a date with destiny. The West, as the black horseman of prophecy, has got a date with destiny along the Euphrates River, and that war is going to take place, and it's going to take place probably sooner than most of us realize, most of us can even believe. Now, you've seen how that Iran has almost now taken over Hamas and the Gaza Strip. We also know that Iran has very well taken over Lebanon, and Hezbollah is well well entrenched in Lebanon, and, and then also we've seen how in the last eight years as Syria has had civil war down there, the Iranians have taken advantage of that uh, chaotic situation. Now we got Iranian installations all over Syria, and that has been the very reason why uh, the American peacemakers have been working so diligently to try to keep an American role in this Middle East situation, especially in the Israeli situation. And that takes me now to another article from the Jerusalem Post dated today. And the title is Netanyahu to Jared Kushner. We had a little event last night. The economic workshop that's scheduled for Bahrain next month is meant to discuss the economic aspects of the Trump peace deal without unveiling any of the political components. Only 12 hours after losing his mandate to form the next government and sending Israel to a new election, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with senior Trump administration officials Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt in his Jerusalem residence Thursday, that's today, to discuss Washington's diplomatic moves. Kushner asked Netanyahu, shortly after he had declared a call to new election, how is everything? And they gave one another a hug, and Netanyahu answered, interesting. And in a brief statement before the talks that went on for three hours, Netanyahu referred to last night's political drama as a little event. He said, it's always a great pleasure to welcome Jared Kushner to Israel, to Jerusalem, to discuss our common efforts for prosperity, security, and peace. He said, I have to say, I'm tremendously encouraged by everything I hear and about how President Trump, the United States, is working to bring allies together in the region against common challenges, but also to seize common opportunities. He said, even though we had a little event last night, speaking of the calling of another election, he said, it's not going to stop us. Netanyahu continued, we're going to continue working together. We had a great productive meeting that reaffirms that the alliance between the United States of America has never been stronger, and it's going to get stronger. Now, I just want you to understand this much. It doesn't make any difference, ultimately. You've got to really get your mind around what I'm about to say. Ultimately, it does not matter whether Donald Trump gets reelected in 2020. It doesn't matter if... Benjamin Netanyahu gets reelected in September the 17th. And the reason I say that is because God Almighty has got all this under control anyway. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why ultimately I don't keep up with as many of the hardcore details, the, 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 the minutia of 
world events. Now, I keep up with the headlines of world events because I want to know which direction we're going. But one of the reasons I don't worry about the, the minor details of so many of these things is because it, it honestly it doesn't make any difference who the players are. God Almighty has said thousands of years ago in his word exactly how these events are going to unfold and how they're going to take place. And my business is to try to uh, follow the news closely enough to see how these world events are fulfilling Bible prophecies. I'm not in the predicting business. In fact, Bible prophecies are not predictions. There's nothing in the Bible that predicts. The Bible doesn't predict anything. The Bible prophesies, and there's a vast difference between a prophecy and a prediction because a prophecy is God declaring the end from the beginning. When you read a prophecy in the Bible, you're reading something that's going to happen no matter what happens. I don't care if half the world blows off. You know, it doesn't make a difference if the oceans dry up because the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. Jesus said not one jot or tittle of it's ever, ever going to pass. He said heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word is never going to pass away. And so the, the events that are prophesied in the Bible are going to take place even if Donald Trump is not the United States president and even if Benjamin Netanyahu is not the prime minister of Israel. I want to give you a, I want to give you a, 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 a different kind of a twist on prophecies. Now, some of you have followed me for many years. I meet people. I've met people just this week up in Kentucky and Indiana that have been following me for 20, 25 years. One lady came in. She had printouts of articles I wrote well over 20 years ago. And so those of you that have followed me, you know that I've talked about just about every subject pertaining to end time prophecies. And one of the, one of the big subjects, especially as it pertains to Christian is the fact that we have seven years of prophecies is about to be fulfilled. That's called Daniel's 70th weeks in the ninth chapter of Daniel. And it talks about how that we're going to see the Pope confirm a covenant with many for seven years. We're going to see the third temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. We're going to see an Assyrian man of sin come in the middle of those seven years. He's going to commit what Jesus called and what Daniel and Jesus both called the abomination of desolation in that temple. We're, we're going to see the great tribulation begin and last for 42 months. We're going to see that six trumpet war. One third of mankind is going to die. We're going to see the mark of the beast. We're going to see the, the 144,000 Jews are going to be sealed. We see two witnesses are going to rise up and preach in the streets of Jerusalem and just so many other prophecies that are going to take place in the very near future. And then all that's going to culminate with the second coming of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the righteous dead, the Christian dead and the rapture of the living church and the second coming of Jesus and the great and final battle of Armageddon. Now, all these things are going to happen no matter who is in power in any country. And one of the big, one of the big subjects that we've talked about so much is how the church and Israel are scheduled, according to these prophecies, to go through that last 42 months of great tribulation. Now, I've explained it on plenty of other videos. I'm not even going to get started trying to explain that in this video. You can go back to my YouTube channel, and you'll see 150, almost 200 videos there that explain all these many, many subjects. And you can, you can get whatever explanation you need, or you can go to my website at kenradgio.com. You can read all my prophecy articles there. It explains a whole lot of stuff that I don't have time to today. But the fact is the church and Israel are going to be going through 42 months that's three and a half years, 1,260 days of literal hell on earth. John said in the book of Revelation, he said, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for, for the devil has been cast down, and he's coming in great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. And that is telling us about the 42 months of the great tribulation. Satan has come to stir up trouble in the world for the last 42 months. And I've taught as very few preachers have taught, that the church is in fact going to be on this earth during those 42 months. And to so many people, that is so shocking, it's so disturbing. And typically, people don't want to hear it. They don't want to believe it. They get mad at me. They think I'm a heretic for telling them they're going through the tribulation. They, they ostracize me. They cut me off, do all these kinds of stuff. And I've just, now that I've done this so many years, it, it doesn't even matter anymore. I've just you know, I almost laugh it off anymore that people get so mad about it because all I'm doing is telling you what the Bible says. But I have come to this point, and it's something that took me 35 years to come to, and that is to realize I have accepted 
with a great deal of acceptance the reality that I'm going through the Great Tribulation. And now I'm taking an approach that I think is, could only have come through some kind of maturity of this subject. And that is the fact that even in the Great Tribulation, the saints of God have great hope. I want to talk to you about hope for a minute before I quit here today, and I don't want to, I don't want to lose you, but I want you to understand, why, why would I even preach all of these things? Why, why would I have a program here every Monday night and every Thursday night and talk about all these prophecy subjects and preach all these Bible doctrines and preach all these gospel messages that I to, did to you if I thought we had no hope? Well, the fact is, everything I'm preaching about, whether it's doctrine, whether it's gospel preaching, or whether it's entire prophecy, it doesn't make any difference. I'm talking about two of the most important things that, that, that should resonate with every living human being. There's two big subjects at, at stake here. Number one is our eternal future. That has to do with what is our destiny after we die, heaven or hell. And the other issue is what about the rest of our life here on this earth? Now, if the only thing you think about is the fact that we're going through the Great Tribulation, then you're very likely to get pretty depressed about that. If all you can do is obsess about the fact that Raggio said we're going through the Tribulation, I just can't accept that, and so I'm going to turn Raggio off, and I'm going to find somebody that doesn't believe that and listen to him. Well, then you're just acting like an ostrich with his head in the sand. That's not going to do you any good. Denial is not any good. Denial doesn't lead to any good. It's better to be informed. It's better to know when the sword's coming and prepare yourself for that. But here's the reality of it. God Almighty is going to be with his saints in a most miraculous, supernatural way. Now, I've talked about some of the details of this. You know that we've got a guy up here in Turkey. His name is Recep Erdogan. I've commented and speculated, as have many other prophecy preachers, that this guy Erdogan looks looks a whole lot like he might qualify as the coming prophesied Assyrian man of sin. Now, in the last election they had just a few months ago in Turkey, his political party took a whipping, and he doesn't have nearly the uh, electoral support that he once had. But nevertheless, he's still a dictator. He's still got several years in his term, and he's a ruthless man who knows how to get his way even when people don't like it. And we see that right now, Erdogan, some of the headlines this week is that Erdogan is tightening up his relationship with Vladimir Putin in Russia. And uh, we also know that, that Iran has uh, dug in its heels, and despite the fact that, that uh, Donald Trump and the American administration has uh, heavied the uh, sanctions on Iran, and that Iran is really, really hurting economically because of the American sanctions, they, it, it hasn't caused them to uh, back down one whit. In fact, their, their boasts are even stronger now. They, they're even more threatening. They claim that they're going to be uh, building nuclear bombs no matter what anybody says. And there's, there's news out this week. If you're following all this domestic news about all this impeachment stuff on Donald Trump and, and all this Robert Mueller investigation, there's, there's things that's coming out of the dark right now that shows how that Hillary Clinton and Robert Mueller and a lot of these people were involved with Russia. While they've been trying to accuse Donald Trump of being involved with Russia, the fact of the matter is Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and Robert Mueller and a lot of these other people have been doing deals with Russia and with Iran under the cover for many years. And that, that under the leadership of Hillary Clinton, we, have, we would have continued to be complicit with Iran. The fact is that when Hillary was involved with Uranium One, she was helping the Russians provide nuclear uh, power to Iran. Now, we've got a world that is so really, really complicated, but despite of how complicated it is politically, it all fits the Bible prophecies. The Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, at the Battle of Armageddon, that it's going to be Russia and Turkey and Iran coming down against Israel. And those are the ones right now that are strengthening their hands against Israel. And they're the ones that's causing the United States so, many, so much grief. They're causing Donald Trump a lot of grief. They're causing all of our diplomats a lot of grief. We've got John Bolton beside himself up there. He's chomping at the bits to try to wipe Iran off the map. And I don't think that's really going to happen because we know what the Bible says. And even this week, I've got a headline here 
that says Jerusalem is about to hold a rare security summit between the United States, Israel, and Russia. Listen carefully. Minutes before the Knesset voted to dissolve itself and send Israel to new elections, the White House announced a security summit to be held next month in Jerusalem between Israel, Russia, and the United States. In June, the United States National Security Advisor John Bolton and Israel National Security Advisor Mir bin Shabbat and Russian Secretary of Security Council Nikolai Patrushev will meet in Jerusalem to discuss regional security issues. And on down the article says the, the main topic is going to be Syria and Iran's involvement in Syria. Now stay with me. I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to pull all these loose ends together and make sense of it for you. The Bible tells us that those four horsemen are going to war on the Euphrates River. Those four horsemen, you can call it the black horse of capitalism. I'm going to say that's the United States. You can call it the red horse of communism. I'm going to say that's Russia, possibly China in the background. And you can talk about the green horse of Islam, but that's going to be Turkey and Iran and some of these other Muslim players. It looks like Saudi Arabia is going to be aligned with the West in that battle can be aligned with the capitalists because they are pretty much capitalists. They're, they're more lovers of money than they are lovers of Islam. But be that as it may, the fact is the Bible tells us that in the last 42 months before Jesus returns, there's going to be a seven-headed ten-horned beast rising up in Europe. Those seven heads come from the beast, the four beasts that was named in the seventh chapter of Daniel. That was a lion with eagle's wings a bear with ribs in its mouth, a four-headed leopard, and a, and a dreadful ten-horned beast. So John saw all of those heads, the, the, the head of a lion, the head of a bear, the feet of a bear, the four heads of the leopard, and the dreadful beast, all of that in one beast. The seven-headed ten-horned beast of Revelation chapter 13 is the British lion and Russia and Germany and a world government. Now, so when I tell you that Britain is fallen to Islam and that Russia and Islam are working together and that Germany is being taken over by Islam. All that plays perfectly into that seven headed, 10 horned beast scenario that, that John told us about in the 13th chapter of revelation. And that Daniel told us about in the seventh chapter of Daniel, we, we are seeing the potential rise of a seven headed beast. That's got a, I hate to say this out loud, but a Muslim Britain, and a communist Russia, and a Muslim communist Germany, and a world government based out of Europe, in which communism and Islam is the strong hand. And that's where the ten horns of Europe, which had formerly been Catholic, are going to be uh, wreaked havoc upon by a little horn Muslim that's going to pull up three of those former Catholic nations and turn them to Islam. That's that's the little horn prophecy. It looks like an Islam uh, Islamist is going to come in there and take over three of those European countries. And we're seeing this happen. We're seeing those countries fall now. They're, they're falling into the hands of Islamists. You look at Britain, look at Germany, look at France, and look at all these other nations. Look at the Netherlands, look at Belgium. Folks, this is no coincidence. This this is not this is not something that's happening that just coincidentally matches up with Bible prophecies. These are Bible prophecy managed events. These are events that are being literally driven by Bible prophecy. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is the word of God that is driving these circumstances. It is the word of God. Did, did you know Daniel said it's God that sets up kings on their thrones and God that takes them down? I mean, if you want to gripe about the presidents or the kings of, or the rulers of different countries, you know, I got a lot of gripes against Angela Merkel. I think she's, she has single-handedly destroyed Germany with her foolishness. I got no use for Emmanuel Macron. He's, he wants to bring uh, France and Europe into absolute socialism. I got no respect for what's going on in Britain because they're letting the Muslims take over down there. So, but it doesn't make any difference who I like. It doesn't matter because all of these are playing by God's. This is God's chess game. This is God's program. And he's going to bring it all. I mean, if God tells us that a third of mankind is going to die in the sixth trumpet war, all I can say is we got a date with destiny. 
And I'm wondering, will I be one of those one-third of mankind that dies? I might be. You might be. And you could freak out and say, oh, my God, I'm going to die in the Sixth Trumpet War. No, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. I don't care. If I die in a war, so be it. It's all arranged by the mind of God. I want to tell you something. If you understand divine destiny, if you understand that prophecy is God's destiny for mankind revealed, then you realize that all I need to do is align myself with God. I need to stay on God's side. Uh, who was it? Abraham Lincoln. I think somebody asked him uh, if he was on God's side, and he responded, said, all I want to know is God's on my side. Because we don't, it doesn't make any difference whose side you're on because it only matters who's, what God thinks about you. If God's for you, the Bible says, if God is for you, you got to get this. And I'm going to take a few minutes and explain this because I really want you to get my message tonight. If God be for you, this is... This is more valuable in the Great Tribulation than, than any other time in my way of thinking. If, I'm, if I know that I'm going into the Great Tribulation, then I'm going to keep it in mind that if God is for me, who can be against me? And I mentioned this in a recent video. I quoted Romans 8:28. Paul said, For we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, who are the called according to to his will. If you know that the hand of God is on you, if you know you have responded to the gospel and obeyed the gospel and done the will of God, then we know that all things are working together for the good. Now, if you, if you really put this in perspective, then you know that in just about every generation, we can show examples throughout the scriptures of how that each one of the saints faced their own tribulation in their own days. Moses was born in a time of genocide. You realize that when Moses was born, Egypt was killing all the Jew boys. And so Moses' very survival was absolutely miraculous. The fact that Jochebed wove that little basket for Moses and saved him alive in the, in the, in the rushes of the Nile River and that Pharaoh's uh, princess daughter saved him and raised him, that was all by the will of God. Moses prospered in the house of Pharaoh in a time when Jewish males had been consigned to genocide to be killed. And even when things got hard at the age of 40 and, and he, he had found himself striving with the Egyptians because the Bible said he chose to suffer affliction with the children of Israel than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Moses chose to be a Jew over being Egyptian, even though he was the adopted son of the Pharaoh. So he spent 40 years, Moses had to flee from Egypt and spent 40 years in exile on the backside of a desert, which, which I would call that a tribulation. I'd call that a great trial. But at the end of that great trial, God called Moses into service at the burning bush and raised him up to be a mighty savior for the children of Israel. And he brought them out by a mighty hand into the wilderness. And ultimately, after 40 years, the, the children of Israel passed into the promised land. Now, my point is this. It doesn't make any difference how complicated your life story is. And I'm speaking now of what the complications that you and I are potentially going to face in the great tribulation. As long as God is writing my life story, that's all that matters. Before we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Now, Moses didn't have a clue how in this world he could ever bring three or four million Jews out of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's Egypt into the promised land. They didn't have any they, they didn't have anything to go by. They, they left Egypt with the clothes on their back, as it were. And yet God sustained them with manna from on high. He gave them water out of a rock. Their shoes never did decay. Their shoes lasted them for 40 years. Uh, he provided for them all the way through. And those who had faith, you got to get that. And that was Joshua and Caleb. Even though it was 40 years later, they were still both strong. And Caleb said, give me that mountain. He said, I'm well able to take that mountain. And so this brings me to one of my points here. If you can believe God in your tribulation, there is a great victory yet to be had even after your tribulation's over. And I'm reminded about, I believe it was James who said, or Jude rather, Jude chapter 1 verse 3, where uh, Jude said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend Listen carefully. You and me 
should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Now, I've preached that a jillion times as to say we need to subscribe to the faith of the saints. And that goes to do with all their belief system, especially their doctrines, their gospel message. But not only that, but it's the very belief system itself, the very faith in God. I'm not just talking about the doctrine alone, but the confidence that they had that God was going to see them through. You want me to talk about Joseph? When his brothers betrayed him, God had showed him in a dream that he was going to have all these good things happen to him. He showed he had this dream about the, the sheaves of the field bowing down to his sheave. That was a, a prophetic vision about his brethren bowing down to him. He saw the sun, the moon, the stars making obeisance to him. That was another similar allegory. And yet it seemed like his actual life totally betrayed the dreams that he had, the prophetic dreams. It looked like the prophecies were even failing him because his brethren betrayed him. They threw him in a dun they threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. He went down into Egypt. He was betrayed by Potiphar's wife. He was put in a federal penitentiary. He he interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker, and then he was betrayed even in prison. But in the end, he was exalted to the position of the second chariot with Pharaoh. And in the end, he saved his family alive because of the hand of God that was on him. Joseph came through his many years of tribulation. David had 15 years of tribulation after God anointed him by the hand of Samuel. He didn't become the king until he had gone through and endured great hardship with, with uh, King Saul, who hated his guts and tried on numerous occasions to kill him. And I'm telling you, there's a trial, there's a tribulation in, in every one of our saga, in every one of our stories, there's a tribulation. But the thing that got these men through that is their faith in God, their confidence in God. And I'm trying to say something to you about this today. In the face of the great tribulation, here we are. There, there's never been a day like this day. There's never been a church at a time in a place like the church in this time and in this place. You as a saint of God, if you're a born again, Acts 238 believer, if you're one who has repented of your sins and you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you've been filled with God's spirit, the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, then you are, you are that new creature. You are that born again believer that Jesus told Nicodemus about in, Je in John chapter three. And th those are the saints of God who will rule and reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. And I want you to understand this. You were not just saved so that you'd be blessed in this world. God didn't save you so you'd have a quarter of a million dollar house and a Bentley sitting in your driveway. God saved you for e the eternal ages. He saved you to live and dwell in his presence and to walk in his spirit while you're here. And a lot of these prosperity preachers are going to find out their prosperity message was absolute heresy. And that brings me to another subject, and that is the fact that truth is going to triumph. In Israel, truth is going to triumph. Israel's fixing to go through the greatest tribulation they've ever seen. A lot of them are going to die. The eighth and ninth verse of Zechariah 13 tells us that two-thirds of Israel are going to die during the great tribulation. One-third of them are going to be tried in the fire like gold and silver. They're going to go through great tribulation. Only 144,000 Jews have any real guarantee in the prophecies of their safety and security. And a lot of that is very true about that the Christian saints as well. Uh, the Christian saints are going to have to face this business with the mark of the beast. And they have to refuse to take the mark of the beast, which is going to force them off the grid. It means that Christians are not going to have any money and any jobs during that last 42 months. And that's going to be a great tribulation for the church. So Israel and the church are going to be in great tribulation. But we are there because of the divine destiny of God. We're doing that for a reason. The reason Israel's going through their tribulation is written right there in the 24th verse of Daniel 9. He said, to finish the transgression, to make an end of iniquity, to bring in righteousness, bring in everlasting righteousness, and to anoint the most holy. So God is going to finish the sins and rebellions of Israel during the great tribulation, and he's going to bring Jesus Christ down, and they're going to bring in everlasting righteousness and anoint him as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the purpose of the great tribulation. And there's going to be great glory of God at the end of it. And the Bible said he, the name of that city, Jerusalem, was is the Lord is there for a thousand years. He'll rule and reign this world for a thousand years. 
And the destiny of Christians is very much similar. After we have suffered for a while, there's a great glory that we have to look forward to. And I'm reminded of what uh, Paul said in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, for the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross. He despised the shame, and now he sat down on the throne in heaven. Think about that. For the joy that was set before him. Now, Jesus saw great glory and great victory beyond Calvary. And that's what motivated him, and that's what compelled him, and that's apparently what encouraged him. And there's a similar scenario with you and me. For the joy that is set before us, you've got to quit looking at the great tribulation. You got to quit looking at the mark of the beast. You got to quit looking at all the trials that you're going to face. The trials are inevitable. You cannot escape the trial. The Jesus said, "In this world you shall have tribulation." He said, "All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution." He said in all of his New Testament prophecies, he said they're going to betray you. Sons and daughters are going to betray their parents. Parents are going to betray their children. There's going to be the brothers are going to betray brothers. Everything about the prophecies tell us there's going to be bad times for everybody. But Jesus said, "Be of good cheer." I have overcome I have overcome the world. He said, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he said in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. Now, next time you get to worry about how you're going to fare in the great tribulation, I want you to quote John 14, 1 to yourself. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, go and prepare a place, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the joy that's set before us. I have the joy of the rapture. Or if I, if I die, I have the joy of the resurrection to look forward to. And so do you if you're a believer. That's the joy. That's the motivation. And I think about Polycarp, the ancient uh, bishop in Rome. 89 years he served this Jesus with his one God, Jesus' name, apostolic faith. And when the enemies came after him to burn him at the stake. When they began to tie him to the stake, he told them plainly, he says, you don't have to tie me to the stake. He said, I've lived for Jesus throughout the best of my 89 years. And he said, I willingly lay down my life for him. That may not be an exact quote, but that's what he said. You need to keep Polycarp in mind and realize that when it comes your time to die, death is just, one more rung on that golden ladder to glory. Somebody said when they cut off Paul's head in Rome, God crowned it in glory. And when you and I die for the cause of Christ, we will have won our eternal reward. And the Bible said that when we see Jesus in those days, the Bible said he's going to wipe all tears from our eyes. God's going to wipe away the tears. Another place called it joy unspeakable. We're, we are headed for joy unspeakable. We are, we're headed for a city whose builder and maker is God. We're going to see a, a, an earthly Jerusalem with Jesus Christ as king for a thousand years, and then we're going to see a new Jerusalem come down from God out of heaven after the old heaven and earth have passed away, and we're going to spend eternity in the city where the Lamb is the light. They have no need of the sun, moon, the stars, because Almighty God on his throne in the body of Jesus Christ will be the light of that city. In fact, I would say the light of the universe in those days. Now, for saints, listen. It's time for you and me to keep the faith. I don't care what the future holds. I don't care if Benjamin Netanyahu does not get elected and if Israel falls into the hands of the wackoest liberals. It doesn't make any difference if the United States falls into the hands of liberals and socialists and communists and Muslims because God said he's got a plan for our lives. David said in Psalm 27, 13, I had fainted 
listen carefully, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you are a true believer tonight, and if you have been born again according to the scriptures, Acts 2.38, John 3-5, through 5, then you are a designated recipient of the eternal goodness of God. And I say to anybody listening to me tonight, you don't have to be a casualty of this world. You don't have to be a casualty of sin or Satan. You can be redeemed. Your life may be a shipwreck right now. You may, you may not have anything to boast about. You may have never accomplished anything. You may, your life may be a shipwreck. Your, your life may be a total disaster right now. Or on the other hand, you may be very successful, but you know there's an emptiness there because you don't have a right standing with God. And I'm saying to you, what the Bible says, it is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. I'm telling you there's a good God in heaven whose goodness is asking you to turn away from your sins today, to repent of your sins, and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. God has given you a plan and a, and a way and a means to have all your sins remitted, put away the record of them expunged. You can be exonerated of all your wrongdoing today if you'll only obey the gospel and repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the life of God coming to you. And the Bible said when he comes in you, like he did on the day of Pentecost to the 120, they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. And that is the initial evidence that God Almighty has filled you with his Spirit, and that Spirit is the eternal life of God. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you have received the earnest of your inheritance. You've received the down payment on eternal life. That's all about the goodness of God. And I'm telling you, I don't care who you are, whether you're an atheist, agnostic, Muslim, Buddhist, Shinto, Confucius, Catholic, Baptist, I don't care who you are. God wants to save you today. God is not willing that anybody should perish. But he's willing that all, you and me, should come to repentance. And so that's what I call you today. If you want to be a recipient of all the goodness of God, then I say right now, why don't you start believing in God like you never believed in him before? Why don't you start believing the Bible like never before? I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to talk about this some more in an upcoming video. But truth is the source of all life. If you're believing a lie today, there is no eternal life that comes from it. If you're involved in a false religion, there is no eternal life that will come of that. You may have a lot of fun with your false religion, but it's going to end up coming to a screeching halt one of these days. The only life that any of us can have has to come from truth. Truth Biblical truth, God's truth, the truth of this Bible is the only real source of eternal life. Nothing else can produce eternal life. You need this word and you need the spirit of this word. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And that's why he came. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I'm straight until it is accomplished. And he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He come to preach the word and the spirit. God wants you to have his word, which is truth, and his spirit, which is truth. And the Bible said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you into all truth. So I say to you, repent of your sins, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost, and let God lead you with his truth, with the spirit of truth, and with the word of truth into eternal life. That's the only path to eternal life. The word of God and the spirit of God is the only agent that can ever get you where you need to go, and that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's my message to you tonight. I thank you for staying with me. Appreciate you being with me tonight. Please come join me every Monday night and every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Central. I'll see you next time. God bless you.